hello and welcome everyone to Theology on Tap. My name is Liza Knight, and I just want to give you a few notes so in case you're not aware. Obviously, right behind this wall, we have the bathrooms, and we also got to see that lovely video. So, a uh, little important things. Uh, if you can, a round of applause to the Knights of Columbus. They were once in the <laughs> First, start introducing you to the Cardinal. <laughs> All right. So, our speaker tonight was born in Steubenville, Ohio, and was raised in Castle Shannon near Pittsburgh. He attended Saint Anne Grade School and Bishop's Latin School before enrolling in Saint Paul Seminary. He received his master's degree in philosophy from the Catholic University of America in Washington D.C. and degrees in sacred theology from both the Pontifical Gregorian University and the Patristic Institute Augustinian in Rome. He was ordained to the priesthood for the Diocese of Pittsburgh in 1977, serving as pastor, seminary professor, spiritual director, and chancery employee. From 1984 to 1991, he worked in Rome as a staff member for the Congregation for Bishops as an adjunct professor at the Pontifical North American College. He returned to the Pittsburgh in 1991. In 1997, our speaker was appointed coadjutor bishop of Sweet City, Iowa, and ordained as their bishop. He adopted the Episcopal motto, Ave Crux Spes Unica, meaning Hail the Cross, our only hope. He succeeded Bishop Sorens as Bishop of Sweet City in 1998. In 2004, he was named co jester Bishop of Galveston, Houston. He succeeded Archbishop Fiorenza in 2006 and received the pallium from Pope Benedict uh, later that year. He was elevated to the College of Cardinals in November 2007 at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. As a member of the College of Cardinals, he participated in Papal Conclave of 2013, which saw the election of Pope Francis. Our speaker was elected as the Vice President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in 2013, and is currently serving as a three-year term. Let's all welcome our speaker, His Eminence, Daniel Cardinal Donato. Thank you very much. Thanks, friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here even given the topic. I hope you will still love me at the end. And, uh, I did notice in that video, wonderful video, did you see it said the Bishop's Palace in Galveston? We don't own that anymore. We sold it to a nonprofit group. It was like an albatross around us. And it was crazy about it, they called it the Bishop's Palace. Only one bishop ever lived in it. Isn't that wild? It was the bishop uh, who came in in 1950, the bishop who was here from 1922 to about 1949 or 1950, lived in it. And then uh, when the new bishop came in in 1950, he took one look at Galveston and moved to Houston. <laughs> and, uh, the bishops have lived in Houston ever since. So, <laughs> Sisters and brothers, let's say a prayer before we begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, make the pure light of your wisdom shine in our hearts and illumine the eyes of our minds that we may learn to understand the words you teach us in the gospel of your beloved Son. Help us to oppose everything opposed to you, to learn to think in a spiritual way, that by understanding your will we may act on it accordingly. For you, O Christ, are the light of our souls and bodies, and we give you glory together with your eternal Father and your all-holy good and life-giving Spirit now and forever. Amen. 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 Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Sisters and brothers, I'm here tonight to speak about a document that uh, the bishops have put out every four years, the year before the national elections, for some time. It's called Faithful Citizenship, or Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. The most recent edition of this was um, published last year, November of 2015. You say, why do we do it, for those who know Latin, we always do it in tempore non suspecto, which means in the time before we could be charged with any kind of partisanship, as it were. <laughs> and we always put out just policies, principles. This is not, this is a teaching document 
it's not a voter guide in the sense that some people look at voter guides, but it has a lot to do every year, uh, the year before a national election with the elections. I was involved in this particular issue of faithful citizenship because as vice president, I was the head of the task force of bishops that went back to the document from 2012 and renewed it and tweaked it. We added some uh, material from uh, the last years of Pope Benedict and the first years of Pope Francis as citations and as resources, and the document is chock full of that. Uh, I think it was one of my, today I saw someone gave a call and they said, we told them to study faithful citizenship and they said, it's too long and it's too complicated. <laughs> so we said, go back and study it anyway, because in fact, one of the things the bishops have done, and I think wisely, since the year about 2004 or five, is to issue this faithful citizenship document. We live in a reality and in a world that is packaged, mobilized, and consumed. And you can't package, mobilize, or consume this any more than you can completely package, mobilize, and consume conscience. Though lots of people would be happy if that could happen. In fact, my secretary got some phone calls from people saying, why doesn't the bishop come out and just tell us how to vote? Because <laughs> ah. we won't do that. We will give you principles though. And the principles may help you, and I hope they will help you as you do form your conscience. Why is that important? Because you are, all of you, adults, and uh, I'm presuming most of you here are Christians or Catholics, citizens of this country, and therefore very capable, capable and able people as young adults uh, to examine the issues, I think with the help of the teaching authority of the church. But the teaching authority of the church helps your conscience. It doesn't replace your conscience. And you need to make conscience, conscience-oriented moral decisions. Um, I had a hand in this document. What did we tweak? Well, one of the things we tried to tweak was to say a little more about forming one's conscience. We have a, uh, a section in here after our opening uh, which deals with Pope Francis saying that love compels us to go out into the whole world and proclaim the good news to all creation. That means, therefore, within our own society, which is a beautiful society, we have many blessings and strengths, and we have a, a, a tradition of political participation. And part of living out the good news is to bring to bear in our political decisions what our faith is. One of the incredible tragedies of what's happened in recent decades is so many religious people go into the public square and try to leave aside uh, their religious faith principles, right? We know that is an issue, and that's a shame because there's no reason why your religious faith shouldn't enter into your decisions in politics because religious faith, if it's a decent religious faith, is informing you every day on all that you do. It's informing you on your way of living a moral life. It's informing you on your conscience decisions in political life. The Catholic faith tradition is a beautiful tradition of revelation and reason. The revelation given to us by God of his love for human beings sometimes takes the form of what we call strict mysteries of faith, like the Trinity, which nobody could figure out, figure out by normal human reasoning. <coughs> that mystery is a gift to us. We only know about something like the Trinity from the Lord Jesus who came among us and began to speak about his Father. By the way, when you look about the way Jesus speaks about God as his Father, have you ever heard anyone so use the first person singular like Jesus did? That should be a dead giveaway that when he starts talking about God as his Father and then he uses his first person singular to speak to us, what a significant and important dimension of life he brings to us. 
That's why I can't fathom how people would just simply lay aside the deep religious faith that so many claim they have when they get into the public square. We may have to be conscious, of, conscious that there are other points of view, of course, and we live in a society that is more pluralist. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't also be a people that is unafraid to state who we are and what we believe. That's the tradition of religious freedom in this country. And I might add, one of the topics in this most recent faithful citizenship addresses an issue that has been happening to us. Whatever side of debate you're on, the tradition of religious freedom is coming under a certain amount of hostility in recent years by some folks. And we have to be clear, because if we're not clear and, and, and state our principles, and we'll, get, uh, we'll get swallowed up. The political realities of our nation prevent, present us always with challenges and with opportunities. We are a society dedicated to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But let's be honest, friends, and this is what we say in the beginnings of this part of forming consciences, that in some ways, the right to life itself is not fully protected in this country. So, even when you go to our founding documents, there are some issues that challenge us. We are a country pledged to pursuit of liberty and justice for all, but we are frequently divided along lines of race and ethnicity and economic inequality, so much revealed in the last year and a half in so many parts of some of our cities. We are a nation of immigrants struggling to address the challenges of many new immigrants in our midst. We are a society built on the strength traditionally of our families, called to defend marriage and to offer moral and economic supports for family life. And uh, for many religious people who have deep, deep sensibilities and principles about marriage, uh, who are being uh, assailed now uh, by being posed as though one is against other human beings because we are pro-traditional marriage. We are a powerful nation in the midst of a very violent war, confronting terror, trying to build a more just, peaceful world, but sometimes the tactic shoes, are they over the top? As you can see, if we just looked around us, there's lots of things to challenge us. We also live in a world which in times is being threatened, by, Pope Francis calls it our common home, it's being threat threatened by some of the challenges relative to ecology. There are so many intertwined and inseparable aspects of our lives together that Pope Francis has said, we are faced with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to deal with poverty, with violence, restoring dignity to those excluded, and at the same time protecting nature. The bishops of the United States have been trying for the last many years to present to voters the year before the election the principles that guide us in terms of public policy. How are we faithful citizens? We should all be participating in, in political life. But as we say in this document here, in part of the introduction, politics in our country can often become a contest of powerful interests, partisan attacks, sound bites, and media hype. The church calls for a different kind of political engagement, one shaped by moral convictions of well-formed consciences and focused on the dignity of every human being, the pursuit of the human common good, and the protection of the weak and the vulnerable. Pope Francis recently reminded us, he said, politics, though often denigrated, remains a lofty vocation and one of the highest forms of charity, inasmuch as it seeks the common good. Inasmuch as it seeks the common good. We, the bishops, along with priests, and you, the laity uh, people, have complementary roles in public life. Fundamentally, we hand on the sense of the church, the faith, teaching of natural moral law, and revelation, but it's you who are in the public square, some of you in various important works, and, and uh, you carry on de facto 
what's going to happen in our society. So to give guidance on moral dimensions is what we do. But we're not there to replace your conscience, and we're not there to exactly tell you who to vote for. We are here to tell you about important issues in political and social questions. So that's the role of the bishops. I get phone calls and saying from people that we should do more than that. But sisters and brothers, that would be replacing your conscience. That wouldn't be instructing. And, and you also have an element of reason in you that should be respected by us. Um, what are temptations in public life, particularly right now? Two temptations in public life in the church's teaching can be this. Let's take, for example, the church's defense of human life. The first is to make a moral equivalence and no ethical distinctions between different kinds of issues that face human life and dignity. Let me say this very bluntly and clearly. The direct and intentional destruction of innocent human life from the moment of conception until natural death is always wrong. It's not just one issue among many. Second, the misuse of these necessary moral distinctions in a way of dismissing or ignoring other serious threats to human life and dignity. Um, that's important too, and that's why conscience decisions are complicated. But I want to make clear from the church's point of view that the two pillars of our respect for the dignity of human life are the beginnings, its fragile beginnings, and its fragile endings. Right now, in at least four or five states, you know, we're having a situation where in fact the state has allowed, and usually what's first allowed ends up being partially mandated, for people to take their own lives for reasons that they reason they want to do. We call it euthanasia, and we're putting doctors in the position of not being those who protect human life, even when it's fragile or in pain, uh, but which they are helpers in ending it. This is an incredibly serious situation, I would say to young men and women. It's a very serious situation. You'll notice how in our culture, and I'm saying this not to be overly critical, but it's the beginnings and the endings of human life of where you start. And then once you get everybody pretty much saturated in kind of use and almost narcotized into that, uh, then you start attacking other things in between. So uh, I cannot tell anyone who to vote for. What I do want to make clear to you is the bishops have never backed down from the importance of the human person as one of the major principles of our common political life. And in the human person, the beginnings and endings of human life are so critical. Now, I would add immediately with that, equally inherent moral evil is, um, is the kind of violence that's in place both in terrorism sometimes and the response to it. You cannot target innocent populations. You cannot torture somebody. That's inherent moral evils, friends. Okay? That's just it's similar uh, to abortion and euthanasia. So as you can see, oh, it's getting complicated. Yes, yes. And that's why people have to look at what I call and what we deal with here is the four principles of Catholic social teaching. The first principle is the dignity of the human person. A dignity given to human beings, not by the state or not by the church. It's a dignity given by the Lord. That dignity is inviolable. Inviolable. Uh, therefore, any direct attack, direct attack on the human person uh, is, a, um, is a major, major inherent evil. Um, I would say the same thing is true with the destruction of human embryos for research. I would say the same thing is true in torture. I would say the same thing is true in the indiscriminate use of drones for violent purposes. I would think anything that smacks of being genocide, s similar to what's going on in some parts of the Middle East right now, so those, are, those are inherent moral evils. And we have to try to make our judgments in light of that. What's the second? 
principle that the bishops talk about, and this is all from normal Catholic social teachings, the dignity of a human person. The second one is subsidiarity. Subsidiarity. It is impossible to promote the dignity of the human person without showing concern for the family, groups, associations, local territorial realities. In short, this is from the compendium of the social doctrine of the church. In short, for that aggregate of economic, social, cultural, sports-oriented, recreational, professional, and political expressions to which people spontaneously give life and which makes possible for them to achieve effective social growth. In other words, don't go big, which you can do smaller. That's what it really means. That's the principle there. The next principle is the common good, the common good. Human rights are protected and basic responsibilities are met. Every human being has a right to life and that makes other rights possible. A right to access those things that are required for human decency. A right to exercise religious freedom publicly. A right to a freedom of conscience. Um, there is a right of the dignity of workers. We have in, uh, in some marvelous religious communities here in Houston, tried to protect the religious dignity of so many of our poor people who work as janitors in our various hotels and office buildings. That has been a, has been a long, difficult issue. Archbishop Fiorenza has been, my predecessor has been particularly good at that. That's, that's an important dimension of the common good. Uh, there are other issues for the common good. The care for creation. Uh, so beyond workers and employment, the care for creation is both a duty of our faith and a sign of our concern for all people, especially the poor. How we go about doing that, even Pope Francis in his recent encyclical, which we quote here, Laudato Si, mentions that there's, this can get complicated, but it's, it's an important aspect of the common good, our common care for creation. Uh, solidarity, that's the fourth principle. Solidarity means we are one human family. Whatever our national, racial, ethnic, economic, and ideological differences. Uh, within our solidarity, the church has for the last 30 years always put an emphasis on the preferential option for the poor, for the weak, and for the vulnerable. That a basic test of a moral society is how it treats the vulnerable in its midst. And Pope Benedict XVI taught that love for the widows and orphans, prisoners, the sick, the needy of every kind, the persons with disabilities, victims of injustice and oppression, and immigrants. These are signs of how we live out our solidarity. So as you can see, these are four basic principles. Uh, we have reiterated them since 2007 when the bishops first put out this document, although they had done it before in other ways. And we reiterated and repeated it this past year. The four basic principles of how we live out our political decisions. Notice, all of them involve very important decisions. There are distinctions morally that we make. Building a world of respect for human life where justice and peace can prevail requires more than just political commitment. It also involves other organizations to work together. Political life and our involvement in it is very important, but it's not everything. I say this to you sisters and brothers, let me make a kind of personal comment. There are many people today within the world, and even within our church, who have, it seems to me, begun to see what our life is right now, though it's very beautiful and very important, is all there is. But remember, it's not all there is. It's penultimate, not ultimate. The ultimate is our call and vocation by the Lord to holiness and to life with him. I'm always surprised when I go to certain funerals and I hear the person canonized. <laughs> we don't do funeral masses for canonization. That might come later, the canonization mass. At funerals, we're praying for the dead, right? We're praying for this person and ourselves for comfort. We're praying that the Lord has mercy. If people are already canonized, if you can't celebrate a funeral liturgy without saying, you know, the prayers are beautiful, they're very comforting, 
but frequently the readings also are a challenge, right? Uh, but where people live only for, for this way of life, then they begin to think that the only way we can show kindness and mercy is to just simply wash away, to dilute uh, what the future means. And that the decisions we make now actually have a bearing on our, our future called by the Lord in our life with him. And that sometimes people make bad decisions. They may repent, that's good. But when they're buried, um, we say prayers with it and ask the Lord to have uh, eternal mercy, to have mercy on them. I certainly want to say this, that it will be true in my own funeral, and I'm about to put something in my will, that there will be no eulogy at all. <laughs> if there is a temptation for such, sing a beautiful anthem from the church musically to take its place. That would be much better. I think we need to be alert that our present life is important. It's penultimate. Our call by the Lord to our ultimate goal is what counts. In fact, within, within the tradition of the church's understanding of reason and revelation, we've always fallen on something called natural law. People say, what's natural law? What does that mean? Natural law just means that the end of something, that is when something operates at its best, that takes priority over human purposes. That takes priority over human purposes. Human purposes are wonderful, they're beautiful. They can't take priority over what the ends of things are. You say, ah, oh, but sometimes it's hard to figure out what the ends of things are. That's true, there's disputes over that. But it's worth talking about, it's worth saying about. It's one of the problems I have with some of the, some of the arguments relative to same-sex marriage. They're not asking questions, what are the ends of things? But this is too, this is too important to a person and their human purposes and their sense of friendship and love. Well, that's important. But what does that say about what marriage is? It's my, my point always on it. What's the end of this thing? What's its final purpose for it? And um, that needs to be taken into account by all of us who are going into the uh, polling booth in the next couple of weeks. What makes beyond the issues, and there are not lots of issues, in fact, this document goes in at some length to uh, some important further issues in religious liberty and whatnot and all. Um, what makes this year's election difficult, if you allow me my thoughts on this a little bit, is that we are dealing also with character. This is what has made so many of the issues more difficult for people. Because we are dealing with the two major candidates anyway, for whom the character issues are problematic. If I could use a kind language. <laughs> the character issues, the issues of credibility are problematic. So beyond the issues that we talk about, which, do, which this document deals with, this document does not deal other than it says we have to consider character when we look for for whom we're voting for, and that's true. But this is a, a special year, an unusual year. I'm trying to use neutral language. <laughs> it's an unusual time. And therefore, the character issues and the credibility issues play into how you examine the principles for many people, which is why I think people are at times, as I phrased, uh, put here, I didn't, decided not to say, but I'll say it now, Space is swarming right now with political opinions and the air is suffocating us. What better time to step back then and to look at the principles? Step back and look at the principles. The character issues will remain. I cannot answer them for you. For some, the character issues become so dominating that they have to make some decision to step outside the major candidates, either to not vote or to vote for another person. Which to my mind, if you do that in conscience in light of all the other issues, certainly possible. You realize that when you do that, that you are therefore not necessarily going to affect who's going to win, right? Except by a protest vote of sorts, and that's, that's always possible. Uh, but young people, what I, what I want to say to you is you have a genuine responsibility to still vote. And you have a genuine responsibility to look at the fundamental principles of the human person, the common good, subsidiarity, and, and uh, solidarity. And to look at how the church has framed 
some really significant issues <coughs> relative to the human person. I mentioned the beginning and end of life, but I'm willing to bring an, right up with them. It may not be exactly inherent or evil, but it's, it's sure getting near that when you see how people are treated, is the immigration issue. I showed the bishops a bit. In the Texas, particularly, we have been very intent on this for a comprehensive immigration reform. Our, our particular policy issues, you could disagree with, but the fact that human beings need to be treated as human beings in this, uh, to my mind, you can't get around that issue. I would say the same thing for people who have found it very hard for the bishops who speak about the beginning and ends of life and agree with us, that perhaps that was a little difficult. The bishops of Texas have just put out a statement on capital punishment. We have tried to be as reasonably clear as we can to show why we think that is wrong and why we think that we should work step by step to see that it's ended. Whole grid of issues. I think we need to do something about health care for all. I just think that the current, and the bishops have said, the current way we do health care, to quote the beautiful Cardinal George, who when the Affordable Care Act came out before we knew all of what was in it, he said, the bishops will remain neutral on some of the details, but the one thing we cannot step back from is everybody gets helped, nobody gets killed. And what happens is, in fact, uh, not everybody gets helped. Some people do get killed. That's why we had a problem. But we're all in favor of affordable health care for everyone. It's been, the bishops have been talking about this since 1955 in the United States, long before it was an issue in uh, the rest of people. So uh, I'm doing this to whet your appetites. Uh, I know that there are going to be questions. I would love to have a discussion. I wish I had full answers to all the questions you will no doubt pose or observations you will make. I have only done the principle as I haven't gotten into some of the particulars, which I can do. Uh, but I also promised myself I would not talk longer than about 27 or to 30 minutes because I think the questions from you in the dialogue are much more helpful to what we are about. This is a serious time, sisters and brothers. Serious issues confront us. Uh, beyond all of our faith and reason, uh, using our minds and hearts, sisters and brothers, never was it, and I'm not trying to be overly pious here, never was it so important that we pray than right now, as we are entering uh, this uh, final days of an election season. Prayer is incredibly helpful for you in this kind of situation. Too many people are robotic when they go in to vote, like robots. Even if someone made what I might consider in hindsight as they talk to me a wrong decision, if that person has truly tried to come to grips with their faith and their principles, and they have deeply prayed, and then they've gone in and cast their vote, I say, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. But what I'm very worried about is the robots and the robotic mentality. Uh, you are here tonight. You obviously aren't robots. You wouldn't be here. You're interested in the questions. And some of you probably would be more interested if I told you how to vote. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. But I hope I've given even some initial guidance in the four principles. And it may be some other observations I'll make uh, in the course of your questions and observations. I look forward to them now. I want to thank you for your very kind attention and listening to me. And let's go into some questions and observations, okay? You have something you wanna say? So thank you so much. So first, let's give a round of applause for the Cardinal.